Hello, History 17B, Autumn Quarter 2023. In Part 1 of this lecture, we looked at efforts of the white middle class to make merit, in quotes, the criterion for getting civil service jobs. In this, they succeeded, and it was better than the spoil system in theory at least, but the test still favored those who got a particular type of education by virtue of their position in society. Poor people could, and did, take and pass the exam, but preparation required greater relative expense for them. We also looked at the section of the white middle class whose ideas of a stable society rested on their own version of middle class morality, particularly when it came to family and gender roles. This basically put the onus on the poor to act like the white middle class, whether such a demand were reasonable or even possible. And finally, we saw members of the white middle class use the power of newspapers combined with investigative journalism to try to bring the awareness of the rest of the white middle class to the realities of life for the working classes. That is a whole lot of white middle class. Why spend so much time on them? During the time period of Module C, the middle class became a powerful voting bloc. And they had quite diverse and often conflicting views on what would count as progress in the now gigantic in many ways United States. Not only did the federal government, including the Senate and House of Representatives, get bigger during this period, but it became a greater and greater challenge for political hopefuls to figure out what would get a big chunk of the white middle class vote to propel them successfully into office. We will return to that more in the next lecture. In the last section of Lecture 12, we will look at the ways the middle class, including both the white middle class and the black middle class, sought to change conditions for the poor and not just change poor people themselves, although that was always still there. I am going to start off the section on laws by saying that although federal laws ended up making the usual list of progressive reforms in textbooks and so on, these were limited and often not well designed or implemented from the perspective of the working classes. And in many cases, federal law was just completely lacking at this time. The laws that most discussions of progressive reform at the national level will point to are the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act and the same year, 1906, the Federal Meat Inspection Act. You've seen and heard about Upton St. Clair's book, The Jungle, a couple of times now, including in the muckraker section of part one of this lecture. You've actually seen this particular meatpacking picture that's on the slide here as well, but I've made it bigger this time around so you can see both what these people are doing. They are stuffing meat into sausage. sausage casings and tying those cases with the sausage links off by hand. And also that most of these people in the photo are children. The man in the middle of the photo is probably the only one over the age of 18. The rest range in age from probably around 9 to 17 years old. You can see that the two little guys in on the left here are wearing scarves. The packing had to be done in the cold so that the meat would not spoil before it was made into sausages. Upton Sinclair, the author of The Jungle, was a dedicated socialist, and he had written the book hoping to get the white middle class to press for reforms in factory conditions and pay. Instead, the voting and political pressuring public focused on the few pages in his book that described in truly disgusting detail the unsanitary conditions in which commercial meat was processed. He meant his readers to sympathize with the workers when he described men losing fingers in grinding machines or dying when they fell into lard rendering vats. 
Some historians have noted that the white middle class seemed more concerned that there was immigrant in their sausages than they were with the plight of the immigrants themselves. Upton Sinclair famously commented, I aimed at the public's heart, and by accident, I hit it in the stomach. While food safety laws absolutely were a good thing, they stopped far short of addressing the more fundamental issues of the workplace. The white middle class was defined and exclusionary largely by education, money, and family structure. Because of severe segregation, often combined with outright violence, including the destruction of Black neighborhoods by white mobs, the Black middle class was defined largely by education. Black Americans were admitted to very few institutions of higher learning run by white people, Oberlin College being a notable exception. The creation of what are now called HBCUs, or Historically Black Colleges and Universities, had begun in the mid-19th century. But you can see that Black Americans founded many colleges throughout the time periods of Modules B and C. Most of these are in the southern states, and you can see that many, many were founded before the end of Reconstruction but by no means all. And I've highlighted some of the more famous schools. The point here is that the educated Black middle class was not just a handful of people. It was not as powerful a voting bloc as the white middle class, but there were a substantial number of highly educated Black Americans. To forget this is to accept the racist narrative that segregationists and white mobs intended to produce, that Black Americans represented an uneducated underclass. Despite the virulence of the racism they faced, Black Americans actively sought out education at all levels. You are looking at Howard University, which was founded in 1867. Circling back to pressure on the federal government, this is Ida B. Wells, later Wells Burnett, who wrote in newspapers and pamphlets, as well as giving speaking tours in both Europe and the United States. Wells was active in women's suffrage and other causes of the time, but most of her energy was focused on a strong anti-lynching campaign. I have seen Wells included under muckrakers in a few places, and in the sense that she used newspapers to try to raise awareness and pressure the federal government, she fits. I have separated her from the muckrakers, however, for one, and to me at least, incredibly strong reason. Other muckrakers could walk away from the issues that they cover and be safe, ordinary, white, middle-class people. Wells did not have this privilege. The newspaper title on the partial article that I've given you there refers to Ida B. Wells, who was chased out of her home and the place where she published a newspaper. You might read this over in your own time and think about the way that the author of the article is turning the idea of civilization discourse in reverse relative to white Southerners by calling them barbarians. Ida B. Wells had lost friends to lynching. There were very few Black Americans in the South who had not lost someone to lynching. In 1895, Wells said, the facts have been so distorted that the people in the North and elsewhere do not realize the extent of the lynchings in the South. I think mm -hmm. that many of us still have trouble getting our heads around how something so patently evil could be practiced out in the open without shame and to such a terrible extent. We are talking about people totaling in the thousands who were murdered on a regular basis. It seems like a no-brainer that one of the progressive era U.S. governments would pass a law at the federal level banning lynching, and yet that never happened. I'm going to expand 
past the module C time period just for this slide. I will read what's on it, most of it, because I know that it's small. Between 1882 and 1968, nearly 200 anti-lynching bills were introduced in Congress. In the period from 1890 to 1952, seven U.S. presidents asked Congress to pass a federal anti-lynching law. 8 April 1918, the dire anti-lynching bill was first introduced in the U.S. House of Representatives by Missouri Republican Leonidas C. Dyer, hence the name. It failed in Senate. In 1920, he tried introducing it again, and President Harding endorsed it. It was filibustered in the Senate. They tried reintroducing this anti-lynching bill in 1923 and 1924, and it was defeated every time. In 1934, the Costigan-Wagner bill was co-sponsored by Senators Costigan of Colorado and Wagner of New York, both Democrats. Then President Franklin D. Roosevelt took too long to sign this, concerned about his re-election prospects in 1936. In June of 2018, 2018, the Victims of Lynching Act was put forward by the three then African-American members of the U.S. Senate, Harris from California, Booker from New Jersey, and Scott from South Carolina. That bill died in the House of Representatives. In 2022, that would be last year, the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act was passed by the U.S. House of Representatives on February 28th, the U.S. Senate on March 7th of 2022, and signed into law on the 29th of March by President Biden last year. Most progressive legislation that directly affected the lives of large groups did not happen at the federal level, but legislative action could be highly effective at the state, municipal, and local government levels. Laws for safe housing, fair business practices, universal child education, sanitation, worker safety, anti-racketeering, and many more spread from location to location. This was spotty and incomplete, but we've also seen that the implementation of even so big a legal intervention as the 14th Amendment faced constant resistance and had only spotty and incomplete success. I find it difficult to focus on bare lists of legislation myself. It's much easier when there is a concrete example to link my thoughts to. So many stories in history are profoundly depressing that I am happy to get to share one that, while not perfect, as nothing ever is, certainly represented an improvement in the situation of New York City's working class residents. On 12 April 1901, the New York State Legislature passed the Tenement House Act of 1901, more commonly known as the New Law or the New Tenement Law, especially if you're in New York. This was only possible because of intense pressure by housing reform groups, leading to then-Governor Theodore Roosevelt, appointing a commission to study the issue of the need to reform existing housing law in New York in 1900. In February 1901, the commission issued a report to the new governor, Benjamin B. Odell Jr. Roosevelt had become vice president by that time, and the report recommended new legislation. The state legislature almost immediately held hearings and Remarkably, only two months after the commission issued its report, the Tenement House Act of 1901 was enacted. So let's back up and see what that act really did. We've talked about New York tenements when we looked at Jacob Reese's How the Other Half Lives. 
the earliest tenements were erected before there was any substantial regulation at all of this type of housing. The first law that governed the actual physical form of tenements was not passed until 1879, and it is now known as the Old Law. Thus, the first wave of tenements erected in New York City prior to that law are called pre-law or pre-old law tenements. The typical pre-law tenement was about four stories tall and housed 10 to 20 families on a narrow 25 foot wide lot. There were generally four units on each of the upper floors with a pair of stores and two rear apartments on the first floor or the ground floor to us. Each apartment had two or three rooms, but windows only lit one room in each apartment, the front one. Thus, most rooms had no immediate access to natural light or fresh air. These apartments were not supplied with gas or water. Some tenements had a single water line with a tap in the hall of each floor. Some had a tap for the building or for the street. Most, however, had both water source and toilets in the shallow backyard. And yes, the bit you are looking at along the fence in the back is toilets. The result of a campaign by reformers, the Tenement House Act of 1879, or the old law, actually did not greatly improve conditions. This law had no effect on tenements that had already been constructed or on row houses that had been converted into tenements. However, the law succeeded in prohibiting the construction of new buildings with windowless interior rooms, requiring that all rooms have windows facing the street, a rear yard, or an interior shaft. The most common design resulting from this requirement was the dumbbell-shaped tenement because the required air shafts shown here in white created a building footprint that resembles the shape of a handheld exercise weight. And this is actually a remaining piece of one of those old tenements. And you can see the air shaft that goes up in between and these rooms back here would have windows opening onto it. Unfortunately, the shafts required by the 1879 law were so small that they provided little light and air to apartments below the top floor, and instead they became receptacles for garbage and created flues that sucked flames from one floor to another during a fire. In addition, the shaft windows of adjoining apartments were so close that privacy was virtually eliminated. The 1901, or new law that we started with, mandated that all rooms have windows and each apartment have its own toilet facilities. An important aspect of the law was its impact on older tenement buildings. The new law mandated a series of changes designed to address the dangerous and unsanitary conditions in the pre-existing tenements. Changes included improved lighting, banning second windowless interior rooms, and requiring the addition of one toilet for every two families. In order to provide the required light and air for the 1901 Tenement House Act, new law tenements, unlike their dumbbell predecessors, typically looked like one of the letters H, C, I, or L, leaving a significant amount of open space on the lot. And you can see this one, it looks like an I or an H, and there's open space here. The new Tenement House Act was the sort of painstakingly pursued local legislation that is less glitzy than national laws, but that really started to make an on-the-ground difference albeit small and painfully slowly, in working class people's lives. Settlement houses were homes where middle class residents lived in the neighborhoods they were trying to help. Most of these residents, the middle class residents, were women. Residents usually stayed for a time and then moved on to other professional work. Not all settlement houses were equally helpful to the working class folks around them. 
good ones could be quite useful. I'm going to talk about the first settlement house in the U.S. in Chicago and a settlement house close to us here in San Francisco, but there were many others. The Hall House building that you see squished in here started life as a mansion that was eventually surrounded by tenements as the wealthy moved out of Chicago's near west side and immigrants moved in. In 1889, Jane Addams on the bottom far right here and Ellen Gates Starr on the image above bought the dilapidated building and began fixing it up, not just as a home for themselves, but as a pleasant place for the neighboring poor to spend whatever they had in the way of free time. Adams and Starr were college graduates well-educated and well-traveled, with zero interest in marrying men, and a social conscience that told them they ought to do something, although they weren't quite certain what. Adams and Starr thought in the beginning that they would offer classes in things like art history and music. When they actually arrived, they realized how ignorant and naive they were. But they gamely watched babies for working women and tried to help neighbors deal with unscrupulous landlords and to find food. Adams recalled later, one of the first lessons we learned at Hull House was that private beneficence is totally inadequate to deal with the vast numbers of the city's disinherited. Adams would live the rest of her life at Hull House. Although Ellen Gates Starr later left, Mary Rosette Smith, who was the third woman on the previous slide, took her place at Hull House. Smith, like Adams, devoted the rest of her life to the Settlement House project. Hull House changed the neighborhood, and the neighborhood changed Hull House. This was not gentrification. Adams excelled at getting the wealthy to donate money and the poor to be honest with her about what they wanted. As more residents came to live in Hull House, Adams and her increasing number of college-educated residents offered child care and then a kindergarten as well, and then courses in just about anything they were asked for. It turned out that people living in the neighborhood, poor people living in the neighborhood, wanted practical help, but they actually wanted the art history and music lessons as well. For better and worse, perhaps, Hall House did try to help immigrants Americanize, meaning offering courses in the English language, American government, and writing. But when the old neighborhood residents wanted lectures on socialism, she hosted a lecture on socialism. When someone in the neighborhood wanted to teach old country embroidery, she gave them a classroom and materials. Over the time that Adams, Jane Adams, lived at Hull House, it turned into a giant complex. I think this itty bitty bit here, or maybe that part behind the bushes there, might be the original mansion. This giant complex had kitchens, a cafe, the kindergarten, classrooms for art, music, and dance, meeting rooms, and a gymnasium, and probably other things that I have forgotten. You can probably guess that Hall House grew to be far more than most other settlement houses. Union leaders, university professors, lawyers, and politicians lectured or taught at Hall House, and they didn't use Hall House to talk to one another. They talked to the people in the neighborhood. This was not something that Adams could ever have funded on her own. But she had something of a genius for getting the white wealthy to contribute while she also still treated her poor neighbors like actual human beings with their own desires and, and needs. So if you look at the slide here, it has just a few pages from a program for one year. The classes include drawing class, Greek art, arithmetic, geometry, English composition, and then there is a working people's social science club, and they have weekly lectures on things like child labor, our jury system, the Chicago police, labor organizations, competition, single tax, and some phases of business done on the Board of Trade. Now, I'm not going to pretend that Adams 
always did wonderful things and never said things that reflected the prejudices of the society she lived in. She did. She herself was human and coming from an extremely privileged position. But I will say that she listened to people and did not constantly assume that she knew best. And she did a great deal of work herself. She didn't just tell other people what they should do. For example, when she realized that garbage was never removed from the neighborhood, she went to the city government, got herself appointed garbage inspector for her ward, and made certain that garbage was collected. If you look here, these bins are overflowing with garbage, and the entire alleyway has at least a foot of rubbish in it. One last thing before we leave Hull House, Adam's residence were mainly college educated in the era of making everything rational and efficient, like the movements of assembly line workers. So the residents didn't just go to government bodies, local or larger, and say that something needed to be fixed. They first collected data. They made maps of where residents came from, how much they were paid, where they got their water, and where cases of typhus broke out. They set the standard for social welfare studies for decades, and eventually Hall House was absorbed into the sociology department at the University of Chicago, where it remains. For the second settlement house in this lecture, we have to go back to the Page Law of 1875. Depending on what we think the actual purpose of the Page Law was, it was either an abysmal failure or a resounding success. The Page Law of 1875 prohibited the recruitment to the United States of unfree laborers and women for immoral purposes. The way that the Page Law was worded did not single out the Chinese. Although its enforcement almost entirely against Chinese immigrants makes the actual motive clear. Also, the law did not actually stop mining and other companies from recruiting male workers in China, which is one thing that it sounds like it ought to do. But it did place the workers so recruited in a precarious social and legal position, which you know from preceding lectures. Similarly, the Page Law did usually stop Chinese men from bringing female family members to the U.S. when they immigrated. But it actually did less than nothing to stop sex trafficking of Chinese women and girls. In fact, it made this worse. So if the point of the Page Law was truly to protect Chinese women and children, it could hardly have been a greater failure. However, if the point of the Page Law was to create an image of Chinese people as inherently immoral and untrustworthy among white Americans, then the Page Law worked perfectly. Men with greater desire for money than scruples about doing harm recognized an opportunity when they saw it and indeed found that it could become very lucrative to bring Chinese women into the western half of the U.S. for sex. Enormous corruption amongst the police force and the San Francisco city government through the latter half of the 19th century actively helped with this trafficking. Through the 1860s and 70s, Chinese women could literally be sold at auction as soon as they disembarked on the wharf of San Francisco with no interference from police or those in power in the city. Once the Page Law went into effect, these sales became less visible, but in no way less frequent. Going back a year before for the Page Law, but when the sex trade was already underway, a group of white religious women founded a house in San Francisco, a mission house, they called it. It was intended to help Chinese immigrant women out of slavery. Now, the white women who founded it also intended to convert the Chinese women and direct them into wholesome marriages with Christian Chinese Americans. This is one of those situations with good intentions, but also with a very limited view of what was best for other people. 
The original house, the actual building, was destroyed in the 1906 earthquake and fire that destroyed so much of San Francisco. In the early years of the 20th century, this laser focus on religious conversion would undergo a subtle but very meaningful change. Donaldina Cameron arrived in 1895 at the Mission House as a sewing teacher. Tian Fu Wu arrived as someone who sought refuge in the house a year before Cameron arrived. Wu went on to the elite Stevens School in Philadelphia and got a college degree in Toronto before returning to the Mission House in 1911 and becoming Cameron's partner in running the house until both of their retirements. The two also lived close to one another in Palo Alto and remained lifelong friends. Cameron is on the left here and Wu is on the right. The woman in the middle is not identified and clearly the house building behind them is a new building dating to after the earthquake and fire. Under Cameron and Wu, people who lived in the house still had to do chores and go to church. But the house began to do more to draw in public publicity and sympathy and to turn the actual daily business of the house over to Chinese or really now Chinese American women, as opposed to only middle class white women. On the other hand, given the white middle class at the time, Cameron got sympathy and funding by casting Chinese women and girls as entirely helpless. The photo on the left is an actual brothel. The photo on the right is a staged rescue for the newspapers. Remember the yellow press of the era. They wanted things that were sensational. Cameron and Wu look on from below as a policeman bravely rescues a child who has been forced into sex slavery. Now, chances are her situation was probably quite real. The rescue itself was staged for the photo. We have here the white savior myth, but it was also an extremely successful strategy and getting sympathy that offered very real help to women trapped in the sex trade from the white middle class. And Cameron used her position as an educated white woman to advocate for Chinese women who had been arrested in a way that they were not permitted to themselves. In fact, she became legal guardian of many women so that they would be counted as Americans when they were taken to court. The rescue publicity, of course, only reinforced the image of Chinese women as sex workers, just as victims rather than vipers. In reality, most Chinese women at the house escaped and made their way there under their own power and ingenuity. And then the house under Cameron and Wu worked to bring awareness to women who became incredibly successful after making use of the house, trying there to combat the helpless sex object myth. Real life is incredibly complicated. The woman driving the car in the photo is Tai Lung, later Tai Lung Schultz, one of the first Chinese women in America to vote. The house did still push for women to convert to Christianity, although not as hard as formerly. It did try to arrange marriages for them, in part as a form of protection, but also the men had to be Christian. Balancing this out, one of the most remarkable contributions of the home was the ability to keep women hidden and safe without keeping them entirely isolated from the world at large. Many former house residents went on to have college degrees and professional careers, often as translators. The house offered classes in Chinese as well as in English. One example of a woman who used Cameron House is Bessie Zhang, who became the first Chinese woman to graduate from Stanford University in 1927. Zhang recalled saying of her aspirations at the time, hey, we're not going to be homemakers. We're going to be career girls. We're not having babies. We're going out in the world and contribute. The image on the right is the only one I could find easily of Dr. Bessie Jong, 
The Mission House built after the earthquake and fire is now called Cameron House, and you can still visit it in San Francisco. You can see it there on the left. Cameron and Wu chose to be buried side by side, and you can also visit their graves in the Evergreen Cemetery in East Los Angeles. For parts C and D to the Good Intentions section of Lecture 12, I am going to somewhat artificially separate what was, in fact, a range of groups that often blended into one another. I'm separating them into clubs and organizations. Well-to-do men had clubs from early in the 19th century, from which women were excluded. The clubs of the progressive era were often women's clubs. Some, like the group on an outing here in the photo, were mainly social clubs. Women used the club structure to organize trips and other events. Many other clubs were centered around more intellectual pursuits. These tended to organize a series of lectures on a variety of topics. Lectures on health and human anatomy were particularly popular. Local women's groups also fed into larger cause-based and overtly political Political organizations. This on the slide is a local group from Petaluma, a local club in Petaluma that is involved in a WCTU function. Woman suffrage was another issue which drew smaller women's groups together. So there was a huge overlap between clubs and social justice organizations. Nowhere was the crossover between so-called clubs and organized social justice action more clear than in Black women's clubs. The Black women's club movement emerged in the late 19th century and comprised a number of local reform organizations dedicated to what they called racial betterment. Because of the constant pressure of white racism, Black women rarely had the luxury of having clubs purely for social reasons. Almost all clubs were also social justice organizations. These grassroots clubs were made up primarily of Black middle-class women who were part of the larger progressive reform movement. Black women formed social organizations to provide concrete services, financial assistance, and moral guidance for the poor. Many of the groups grew out of religious and literary societies, which responded to the intensified racism in the late 19th century. Although organizations existed all over the country, the one you see on the slide there is from Iowa in 1903, the largest number was concentrated in the Northeast. Women involved in the club movement were generally well-educated, understood racially-based poverty, studied healthcare, and possessed amazing organizing skills. The local groups were usually narrow in focus and supported things like homes for the aged, schools, and orphanages. All of this is very much in keeping with the reality that national laws were not going to help Black people. In Washington, D.C., the Black women's club movement was dominated by teachers who were concerned about the massive problems faced by Black children. In New York City, club women honored Ida B. Wells for her political activism to pub publicize the prevalence of lynching. Like middle-class white women, middle-class Black women focused on helping the poor. But in this case, the basic premise was different. Most of these middle-class Black women felt that if white people saw educated, hardworking Black people, it would cause them to question their racism. That seems naive now, and you will see it called respectability politics, but it made perfect sense to women who honestly believed that Black people could affect the entrenched racism of the white American population. It was an action of hope. Black middle-class club women sought to teach the poor how to keep a household, manage a budget, and raise their children to fit into larger middle-class ideals in the hopes that they would be incorporated into the middle class as a whole. 
We know that did not work, but it was not an unreasonable strategy on the part of the women who participated. Active club participants held conventions, conferences, and forums to engage the intellectual elite. In 1895, Black women organizing at the local level made concerted attempts to develop national ties. The New Era Club in Boston began a publication, The Woman's Era, which covered local and national news of concern to Black club women. And you can see some front pages there on the slide. Two national federations of local clubs were formed in 1895, and the next year they merged to become the National Association of Colored Women, or NACW. At that point, we are looking at an organization with avowed larger national goals, rather than local activists associated through clubs. So we will make the shift to the organizations section of the lecture, but noticing how seamlessly clubs graded into organizations. The National Association of Colored Women, from now on just the NACW, took the motto, lifting as we climb, to signify their hopes that if Black people changed, so would racism. While it became clear that changing Black people was not going to change the white population committed to racism, the NACW was effective at the meeting place of civil rights with women's right to vote. Mary Church Terrell, pictured on the left part of the slide here, was both one of the founders of the NACW in 1896 and the organization's first president. Other founding members included Harriet Tubman and Ida B. Wells. Mary Church Terrell was born in 1863 during the American Civil War. Though both of her parents were born into slavery, they managed to become one of the wealthy African-American families in the U.S. who managed to weather racism to the extent that they stayed wealthy enough to educate their kids. As a result, Terrell received a very good education, including a degree from Oberlin College in Ohio, which I mentioned earlier, as one of the exceptions to segregated higher education. Oberlin was included everyone from its inception. NACW members faced racism in the white suffrage movement. And Terrell sought to raise awareness of this among potentially sympathetic white suffragists. In a speech to the National American Women's Suffrage Association, NAWSA, Terrell told the white suffragists to, quote, stand up not only for the oppressed women, but also for the oppressed race. Unfortunately, while there were sympathetic white women, they were generally outnumbered by those who felt either that addressing racism would hinder their own fight for the vote, and even worse, those white women who based their right to vote in racism. Incidentally, the NACW, not the NAWSA, the NACW still exists, and they have an extensive website if you would like to go check it out. I am going to introduce more organizations here, but not dwell on them. Many will show up in coming lectures, which is why I want to introduce them. The Niagara Movement was developed in 1905 by a group including William Monroe Trotter and W.E.B. Du Bois. Trotter and Du Bois's mission was to develop a more forceful plan for fighting racial inequality. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP, was an outgrowth of the Niagara Movement and was established in 1909. I found that while many people are familiar with the work of the NAACP from the 1950s or 60s on, most don't realize that it was founded in the context of the progressive era. The National Urban League was established in 1910. The organization's mission was to end 
racial discrimination and to provide economic justice to African Americans who migrated from southern rural areas to northern cities through the Great Migration, which we will talk about when we get to World War I. The National Urban League also still exists, and they have a website if you want to check it out. I am going to end this incredibly long lecture here and potentially take on white women's suffrage groups, you notice I left them out, in another lecture if, and only if, people send me emails saying that they are interested. Key points to Lecture 12, both parts. The U.S. federal government increased in size and complexity at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th centuries. This is because the nation itself was growing in every way. Geographic size, population, industrialization, urbanization, and so on. Over this period, the white middle class grew in size, but also became hugely influential in politics. They formed an increasingly large, if not always consistent, voting bloc. The white middle class was defined by socioeconomic factors. Here, think both education and financial well-being. The white middle class at the turn of the 20th century saw a great deal that frightened or disturbed them in American society as a whole. However, different parts of the middle class disagreed on how to improve the situation. Civil service reform worked to put educated middle class men and women into federal jobs so that they could make a difference from their positions using notions of managerial science and efficiency. White evangelical Christians often felt that the poor were to blame for their own situation. This group favored anti-vice campaigns against things like alcohol consumption and sex work. Muckrakers were middle-class investigative journalists who tried to raise awareness of injustice among the white middle class. The awareness was among the white middle class, not the injustice, through articles in newspapers. Muckrakers hoped that the white middle class as a group would then pressure politicians to make changes to help the working classes. At the national level, protective legislation really only took shape for issues affecting the white middle class fairly directly. For example, national food safety laws went through, whereas anti-lynching laws did not. Because of white racism, the black middle class was defined more by education than by wealth. Most progressive changes that made a difference on the ground came at the level of local, municipal, and or state governments responding to concentrated middle-class political and legal pressure. Some educated middle-class white women started settlement houses in an effort to help the working classes by living among them. Many early statistical studies on aspects of poverty came from settlement house residents. Women, all women in the U.S., joined together to form clubs. Some of these were strictly social, while some were intellectual or involved in some sort of activism. Many blurred the lines by being all of these things at the same time. The work of Black club women was a critical part of both the early roots of the civil rights movement and the women's suffrage movement. Many of the organizations that will become crucial in civil rights activism in later lectures got their start in the first decades of the 20th century. These include the NACW and the NAACP. I am going for a one-slide coda here because lecture 12 is so long. My research touches on women's classes in the gymnasium at Hull House. Among a number of activities, instructors under resident Rose Giles taught immigrant factory women basketball. This proved so popular that by World War I, Hull House had two full women's basketball teams, plus what was basically a JV team with younger members. When Rose Giles retired and in the wake of World War I, 
there were dance classes for women, but there were no longer competitive sports classes. 